Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 18th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, what is a shadow deficit and why should we be concerned about it? Second, why George Orwell's book, 1984, is relevant to this year's Alaska election? And third, what the employment numbers are telling us about the Alaska economy. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. On Tuesdays, anyway, Brad Keithley joins us, and we get a chance to discuss all these different things that are going on around the world, and he's with us right now. Good morning, Brad. How are you, my friend? Michael, I'm doing great. Literally, good morning to you. <laughs> I know, really. It's like, oh my God. I mean, it's one of those things where you sit up bolt upright in bed and like, this is not right. Something is not right. What is it? So uh, anyway, it happens, I guess, to the best of us, but uh, you know, I'm always a little discombobulated when it happens. So, um, But the real, the real challenge is going to be doing the show without coffee. That's... Uh, there, I will admit that some mornings I end up doing the show without coffee because I couldn't be bothered to make it or something like that, and that's why it gets delivered to me. Luckily, I have my own concierge service in the in the form of my son or my wife, so it's all it's all good on that right. But okay, let's <coughs> excuse me. Let's talk a little bit about um, this article from James Brooks in the Juno Empire. We hit on this pretty hard yesterday, but I really want to get your take. On these and your thoughts on this whole shadow deficit idea that uh, Brooks has laid out. Well, Brooks really does a great service, I think, in in finally addressing an issue that, frankly, we talked about during the legis- during the legislature. You and I talked about during the legislature, and, and we've talked about uh, other times, which is which is what are we doing today that affects tomorrow. When you do a when you do a federal budget, they always talk about ten year projections, right? And they focus on what the deficits are, deficits are that are being created for the next ten years into the future, uh, for, or the the positive effects in the next ten years into the future from any given from any given act. They realize that uh, a step today is is not just confined to today. It is uh, it, it has impacts that flow through to additional years. A good example of that is um, Medicaid, right? Uh, Medicaid, you pass a Medicaid bill and not only are you pass Medicaid uh, 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 changes and not only does that affect the current budget, the current year's budget, but affects the budgets going into the future. We've not done a good job of that at all uh, in Alaska. We've always focused on just the current year there, there are 10-year projections out there. The administration is required to do 10-year projections uh, at the beginning of the session, and legislative finance will do projections uh, at the beginning of the session. But once you get into the session and once you start talking about the budgets, uh, it, all of that is, is set aside, and they just focus on that year's budget. I, I, I would guess that legislators would tell you that's because it's enough of a, of a hill to climb to try to get through this year's budget. Um, but but what you do when you when you do that is you sort of lose perspective on the consequences of the actions um, you're taking today. And and James Brooks's article, I think, is an excellent piece that sort of um, uh, reaffirms that 
and 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 what I told James is creates a term that we can now use to talk about it, shadow shadow deficits. Uh, we can that, that really sort of you know now gives us a common language that we can use to talk about these things. Well, it's interesting, and I'm glad he came up with a term because this is something that I've been talking about for years, even prior to to meeting you. Uh, was the you know kind of this unintended consequences, this lack of long term vision on the part of our le- not just this year's legislature, but a-, a lot of legislators for the last fifteen or twenty years at least, this lack of long term vision. Uh, they don't look at the unintended consequences of their laws. You know, you create a program today, sure, it only costs you know ten million dollars a year today, but what does it do? In you know, in three years, in five years, in ten years, in fifteen years, what what is the unintended consequences of that? And and we've seen it. You know, we we've talked often about this program about how people have argued against specific programs because hey, this could cost us a lot more uh, down the road. Maybe today we're only paying ten percent, but maybe in a few years we might be paying a hundred percent. And of course, they're always told, well, if we if something happens, we'll just stop doing the program. And of course, what happens in the interim is that people get on the program, they become dependent. So when you go to cut the program down the road, well, you can't do that. Now people are depending on it. And and it's it's really almost as if in some cases it's intentional, but this has been a problem for decades in this state. It it is. And and it, I mean, it it manifested itself this year in HB 331, the old gas tax credit bill, right? That, 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 that bill uh, we were facing about $180 million in taxes, uh, oil, oil tax credits that were due this year uh, under the statute and due to be paid. Uh, that was that's a big number in, in, in you know when you're talking about a budget uh, of the size that we've been talking about in this state. And and so one of the ways that they proposed to deal with that uh, was through the oil tax credit bonding bill. Which reduced the 180 million dollars this year down to something like 20, 25 million dollars, if my if my memory is is operating correctly this morning, um, and reduced this year's uh, budget, um, or at least uh, reduced the pressure on this year's budget. Whether it actually reduced the budget is a question, but it reduced the pressure on this year's budget. But it but at the expense of kicking those costs down the road. Um, uh, particularly into, in the case of 331, particularly into the middle of the next decade. Well, the, the problem with that is we've kicked other costs down down the road uh, into the middle of the next decade. Uh, a big one is PERS and TERS. The way we redid PERS and TERS in 2014 was, was exactly the same way. We reduced the current cost, but we put it on an upward sliding scale that significantly increases the cost uh, in the out year. So the 2014 budget looked better, or, or frankly, what happened in 2014 is they just spent more capital money because they didn't have to spend as much on PERS and TERS. Um, and, and, but, but at the expense of ramping up those costs uh, into the late 20-teens and into the 2020s and indeed into the 2030s. One of the disturbing things about James Brooks's article is a quote from Pat Pitney, who's the director of office of uh, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, saying, "Well, we're going to get some new numbers on the retirement uh, account, the retirement obligation this fall, and it looks like those numbers are going to go up even higher." So, not only have we kicked the can down the road, uh, we're kicking it down in a way that is that is expanding the cost down the road. Frankly, the reason that does that under PERS and TERS is because they've assumed an 8% return uh, off of the PERS and TERS investments. They're not getting that. We're going to have to make that up with additional payments, um, and and that's where those costs are coming from. But we don't look at any of that. I mean, if you would have, if, if you would have as we tried to, if you would have looked at, at, at this budget on a 10-year basis or on a 15-year basis this year and looked at what you were doing with 331, reducing current costs, Paying out a bunch of money to producers, borrowing from the from the market, reducing current costs, but kicking that can down to the road into the 2020s, you would have had a whole different attitude. I think the legislature would have had a whole different attitude about that bill 
particularly if you were realistic on PERS and TERS, than what they did. They just saw it, they saw it as a reduction this year. Goody, goody. You know, we don't, we don't have as much pressure on the budget this year. We can frankly kick in a little bit money for K through 12 at the end of the session as they did without, you know, really exploding the budget because we reduced um, uh, all tax credits by 180 or by $160 million, $150 million. Um, you, you're just not seeing the full picture. And so, I think James uh, does a wonderful job of starting to talk about those things. Hopefully, he continues to talk about those things. Uh, he and others continue to talk about those things going forward. Hopefully, this isn't a one-off uh, article. If it is, we'll have, we'll have lost the the opportunity, I think, to to frankly get a le- lot better handle on the budgeting that we're doing in this state than we've done to date. Well, and I think you're you're really nailing it again here when you're talking about the legislature, kind of if they had thought about it, if they had known. We had Tammy Wilson on the program who had said that she'd listened to our original that one day when we just had that blistering discussion on how, you know, on how derelict of duty the legislature was by passing 331, including Tammy Wilson. She said she wanted to rip her radio out of the dash. She was so upset. And then when we sat down and talked about it, she's like, well, we'd never heard it. We never heard this analysis. We never talked about this thing with Ed King. We never, you know, looked at the long term, uh, you know, or we looked at it, but they never talked about not paying things out in the long run. They never talked about, I mean, these are just things that never came up. Again, this is part of the problem with Juno being in this bubble all by themselves with nobody really able to come in there except for these special players. Nobody else could go down there and really talk about it. And so they're stuck and, and that's part of the problem. Yeah, one, yeah, one of, of the things, things that, that the, the, the more, more I spend time, time on federal, federal issues and, 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 and state, state issues, issues at the same, same time, one of the things that, that, that happens at the federal level, level is you've got groups like, like Committee for Responsible, Responsible Federal, federal Budget, Budget, the, the Concord, Concord Coalition, Coalition uh, ADI, the American, American Enterprise, Enterprise Institute, Institute, Heritage, Heritage Foundation, Foundation, groups that, 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 that really focus on fiscal issues as they're coming through Congress and will keep the focus on the long term. Um, and, and the Congressional Budget, Budget Office, Office, which is, is the Congressional level, level equivalent of the legislative, legislative finance, finance of it in, in Alaska, Alaska, the Congressional Budget Office will keep it on, on a long-term uh, perspective. But we just we have not developed that sort of structure in this state that that keeps a focus on uh, keeps a focus on long-term fiscal issues. It's all what can I get this year. Uh, uh, you know, how much capital budget can I get this year? How many ground ba- breakings can I can I schedule myself to go to this year? Uh, that's when we had that's when we had money, um, and really not you know not pay attention in the 2010 to 2014 timeframe into the long term consequences of spending as much as we were spending, as opposed to saving it. Now that we've gotten into this fiscal crisis, now only looking at it year to year. You know, how can I how can I work through this year? How much how much DGF and uh, uh, designated general funds can I reclassify or use to fund undesig- uh, unrestricted general funds? Um, uh, the unrestricted general funds category to sort of cover up how much I'm spending. Uh, and yeah, that's going to create a hole next year, uh, but I'll deal with that next year. That'll be next year's problem. At, we, we just don't have the, 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 the groups like um, uh, uh, Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget or AEI that, that look after these things on a long term. We try to do this with Alaskans for sustainable budgets, um, but frankly, you know, as you as you say, they're down in Juneau, um, and and Tammy's a good indicator. They don't always listen to to what we're trying to say or what we're trying to say on these on these broadcasts with you. So we we get stuck in these holes and and there are there are serious serious consequences. I'm I've said on this on the program before and I'll be saying it uh, until we hit this problem in the mid 2020s. We've done serious damage to ourselves in the mid 2020s with HB331 by 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 not funding that obligation now getting it off the books before we hit you know the increase in person tours. Um, we're, we've just labeled, we just, we just ladled a bunch of more costs on the mid 2020s, and, and we just don't look at it that way. I, it's frustrating. I'm glad James Brooks wrote the article. Hopefully, legislators uh, will be reading the article. Gubernatorial candidates will be reading the article, and they'll realize and they'll and they'll start to account for the fact that we uh, that we have these shadow deficits out there that we need to take into account. Now, let's talk for a minute about those shadow deficits specifically. 
You've we've talked about Medicaid, Medicare. Obviously, this what I call you know this economic sorcery that they try and and pull on us this this shell game voodoo stuff, where they say, "Look at us, we cut this and we cut that," and what they did is they didn't cut anything; they just underfunded it. It doesn't uh, doesn't change your obligation. It's like saying, hey, look, I cut my bills every month and just didn't pay my credit card bill. The bill is still due. It just means that I push that payment into another month. And what they've really done <clears throat> in this uh, case is they have uh, they have hurt the providers in the state of Alaska. The providers in good faith provided the service to these patients for the state of Alaska. And they basically said, here, you hold the bag while we do this parade about how great we are on cutting the budget and you hold the bag for 60 to 90 days while we wait for the new fiscal year to roll over and then we'll put it onto the next year's tab and then you'll get paid. Um, I mean, to me, it's offensive. It really is offensive that that's what they've decided. They don't have the balls to go out there if they disagree with the program to actually change the program, to, to take their, their, their status as the legislature and overrule the governor and say, we don't like the program. We're going to quit. We're going to cut it. Instead, they just don't fund it which is a coward's way out, yeah. in my opinion. Well, it, it's, it's interesting. Basically what happens is the providers then have to go to their banks and their lenders to borrow money to tide them over until the state comes current again on its accounts, uh, on its accounts payable. And, and so the state's essentially borrowing money through health care providers, forcing them to go to their banks uh, uh, to tide the state over when the state doesn't want to fund it. It, it is – it, it, it is a, a ridiculous thing. And, and you know, it's sort of the Senate. The Senate got themselves into this hole by doing what they called, the, you know, the great Medicaid reform, which basically was trying to requalify a bunch of things uh, for federal money that previously had been paid by state money. Uh, not cutting any programs, not cutting any real expenses, but trying to jigger around the, the categories so they could qualify for more federal funding. Um, and then they said, you know, they claimed they had savings of, of a significant amount through through that reform, and then then when they get to this year, they realize that they realize, oops, <clears throat> we didn't have those. We didn't realize those savings. Other costs sort of filled in that hole that we thought we'd created by this sort of reform. But we're still going to claim those savings by just short paying the obligation, um, and it does. It roll it rolls it into the next year. Uh, they're trying to dodge it in this campaign, I assume. Um, and trying to dodge responsibility for it by claiming they have a lower budget than they otherwise would if they would have faced up to the responsibilities, but it's just l rolling them into the next year. I, th that's that's bad. Uh, underpaying you know, a year's obligations and forcing them to roll into the next year is bad. But but we've got, I mean, HB three thirty one is a good example of of much worse things. There they're not they're not just sort of running it from year to year, not running it from you know, we'll short pay you in June, but you'll get it back in July. It is literally taking it out of the current year and dumping it off into the 2020s and say, you know, using the future as a toxic waste dump uh, and saying, you know, good luck uh, out there facing it. Uh, we don't know what your revenues are going to be. We don't know what oil is going to be, but we sure know we've given you a bunch of costs. Uh, uh, and uh, and we haven't faced up to it when, when they came due on our watch. We just dumped them onto your watch. Uh, and that that to me that to me is worse. It's worse than it's worse than this trick that they're pulling with Medicaid of just short paying at the end of the year. It is literally, you know, taking a bunch of costs out of this generation and dumping it into the next generation um, uh, irresponsibly and 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 to some degree immorally because you know this generation ran these costs up right. This generation passed the passed the bills that created the costs. That said, they came due uh, in 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 these particular years, and now if they've come due, they want to satisfy the producers because they're going to go out and borrow the money and give it to the producers. Uh, but they don't. This legislature doesn't want to face up to the cost they've created, so they're just going to scoop them up and just dump them off into the future sometime. And that's just I doing that to a future generation is, is just sort of fundamentally violates violates the fundamental rule of we shall leave at least as good a future to our kids, uh, if not better than was left to us. The, now, now we're into, 
yeah, too bad, kids. Uh, we're going to run up the credit card. We're going to spend all this money. We're going to incur all these obligations. But guess what? You're the ones who are going to get to pay it. Oh, I know you're going to have obligations of your own. Oh, I know you're going to have programs that you want to pursue on your own. Yes, I know the 2020s are going to be different. Yes, I know we don't know the revenues, but eh, here's here's a bunch of costs. Good luck. Right. Well, that's monkey see, monkey do. Same thing going on at the federal level. Let's indebt our children's children's children, and we'll make it okay. Um, one of the things that Brooks went at, did did talk about, which I, I really would wish somebody would break this out a little bit better, is he talked about the permanent fund. And, and he included in the shadow deficit the fact that if we paid a full permanent fund, that would also increase the shadow deficit. Again, disregarding the fact that we used to not account for the earnings reserve you know, payment into the earnings reserve and the payment out of the earnings reserve for the permanent fund. That used to be, that was not part of the equation. And in fact, for many years prior to, I think it was Bill Sheffield who finally had the legislature sign off on it for a, for a dozen years. It just did it automatically. It was not even part of the budget calculation. And of course, since Walker took over, he added it both to the income and the outgo of the uh, of the budget calculation. So then they could justify it as a government expense thereby justifying in the minds of some Republicans, which is why I think that they never made a squawk about it, uh, as, because they think it's welfare in their minds anyway, and it was justification for them to then go ahead and cut it. Yeah, it's this This is part of the whole George Orwell thing that's going on in Alaska right now. I, for 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 listeners who, who haven't read or haven't studied George Orwell's book, 1984, it's, it's worth – it's worth maybe going and finding the cliff notes if you if you don't have time to read the whole thing. Um, it, what Orwell did was was sort of look into the future um, and 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 imagine a future where governments started changing the meaning of terms. Uh, it was called news in the book. It was called Newspeak in the book, uh, and governments started just changing terms um, uh, and and changing the the, the debate. Uh, by by changing by changing these terms, I, I, a good excerpt from the book that I always go to is it says uh, uh, the Ministry of Truth, which concerned itself with news, entertainment, education, and the fine arts; the Ministry of Peace, which concerned itself with war; the Ministry of Love, which maintained law and order; the Ministry of Plenty, which was responsible for economic affairs. Their names in Newspeak uh, were certain terms. Employing the concept of double think, the party gives ironic names to its branches as a way to euphemize what they actually are. So when you're when you're making war, you call it the Ministry of Peace because this is this is making peace. You know what we're doing is making peace, even though we're killing people. It's you, you just create you just create new terminology and you try to redirect or reform the debate through this new terminology. And this administration, frankly, has has gone into double time in doing things like that. So for example, uh, the permanent fund dividend, which for a lot of years was counted essentially as off the books uh, revenue. It came, it came out of the, um, it was required by statute to come out of the permanent fund corporation into the permanent fund division uh, of the Department of Revenue and then was paid out to individuals. Didn't even really come into government accounting, was sort of held out in a category that was ca that was called other, sometimes held out in the in the designated general funds because it was designated by statute, never re never really considered part of the books. Two years ago, all of a sudden, they reclassify uh, permanent fund dividends as unrestricted general funds. Funds coming into the general funds coming into the general fund that then could then could be appropriated in whatever manner the the legislature chose. And once you call them unrestricted general funds. Then, then yes, if you're appropriating for the permanent fund dividend, you're 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 you know digging the deficit deeper because the deficit is measured by what's in unrestricted general funds. Another category is 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 calling uh, the budgets that the Governor Walker is now running around the state saying we have a sustainable budget. Well, no, you don't. <laughs> I, not in any sense that anybody else understands. I mean, you're still. Uh, you're short seven hundred million dollars in even balancing the budget, but a sustainable budget is more than that. A sustainable budget not only looks out for what is good for government, it looks out for what's good for the overall economy. And the only way you've gotten to this point 
where you're, where you're even just $700 million uh, short in the budget is by taking money out of the private sector in a way that ICERS told us since 2016 has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy and is by far the costliest of all the alternatives to Alaska families. So you're, you don't have a sustainable budget. You've got a budget that is good for, good for the top 25% because they don't have to pay a proportionate share of the cost of government and is good for government uh, uh, employees in the government sector, those who depend upon government spending, but it's not good for the overall economy. It has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy, and it has by far the costliest impact on Alaska families. So it is, it, it's not sustainable. Another example is going around and calling SB 26 the Permanent Fund Protection Act. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't protect anything. Uh, it, the Supreme Court is. <laughs> <laughs> well, but this this is the whole this is the whole thing that that what this what this administration and to, and to a large degree what the what the Senate majority have done they've read they've read they've taken words that everybody signed on to sustainable protection uh, 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 you know unrestricted general revenue. They, they've they've taken they've taken words that everybody signed off on, but they're applying them in completely different ways, and they're they're trying to get the benefit. I mean, Scott Scott Goldsmith worked for d decades on building up the concept of what a sustainable budget is. Right, build up the concept at the time of the last election, uh, the 2014 election. There was a lot of you know a lot of pressure for people to say that they supported a sustainable budget. Walker did. Parnell never did. That was one of the reasons that, you know, people went for for Walker. And and now he's just morphed the you know word sustainable into something entirely different. We, we've we've got we've got a an Orwellian situation going on um, uh, in Alaska, and it's just frustrating as heck because people are using terms. That, that don't have the meanings that uh, that are normally associated with those terms. Well, it's the disingenuousness. I remember that first time that Walker actually sat down at that press conference and showed how the permanent fund would be exhausted in three years if we just didn't <laughs> save it by destroying it. And all I could think of was the mental gymnastics you would have had to jump through to justify uh, to justify that is insane. I mean, the, the mental gymnastics that you have to do – is just it makes no sense at all. Yeah, it's 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 like they sat down and maybe they did. It's like they sat down with their with their campaign staff and said, "Okay, what themes would sell best with the public? What terms are going to sell best with the public?" Um and and then you sort of say, "Okay, well, here's the terms we need to use." And you and you just apply them to what you're doing even though they don't apply. You just, you know, you say we're protecting the permanent fund dividend. You say that we have a sustainable budget. You say that permanent fund dividend revenues are unrestricted general revenue or unrestricted general fund revenues. You just say it. And and part of the problem is the press hasn't challenged it, right? So Trump, if you look at the national press anymore, it took him a while to get there, but anymore the national press uh, when Trump says something that's just wrong, like he did, you know, yesterday about Germany, about the about the German crime crime uh, uh, levels, right? Uh, when he says something wrong, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post, or C or, or any publication will say um, President Trump said this, but this is false, right? Well, we don't have that in Alaska right now. The newspapers aren't going. Uh, Walker called it a sustainable budget, but it's not. Or Walker says that it's the Permanent Fund Dividend right. Protection Act, but it's not. Right. We don't, we don't have that. Somebody's and, got the four Pinocchios, but they're not. Nobody's doing the four Pinocchios with uh, with with Alaskan government. Right. So we've got we've got this Orwellian situation that's just frustrating as heck. Um, <clears throat> and hopefully we'll catch somebody will catch up it with some point at some point. James Brooks, I think, uh, did a decent shot. Uh, with the shadow deficit article, um, uh, Matt Buxton's done a decent shot in uh, uh, in the Midnight Sun, Alaska, uh, by talking about you know one of the winners of this session were the wealthy uh, because they you know they didn't have to pay much. It got taken out of the the with the revenues that the state used got taken out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaskans. Um, but it's sort of it's sort of one off deals. We don't have 
we don't have a constancy of the press following up uh, on these statements being made and and really doing a good analysis of, of whether they're true or not. Brad Keithley is our guest. He's with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We've been talking about the shadow deficits, my new favorite term, uh, that has come out. And we're also talking about, uh, you know, kind of this, again, this Orwellian doublespeak, this, re, this reconvocation of the language that the government seems to be just hell-bent on and all the things that they're doing right now. Um, Brad, this comes back again to this election season now. Now we're going to have all these critters out there who have been, again, manipulating the language, and they're going to get into this whole issue of – uh, of of the you know of the elections and they're going to be using this double speak. They're going to say things like, uh, "Well, you know, we're here to do sustainable. It's a sustainable budget. Our budget is sustainable. Our our permanent fund is protected. What we did protected the fund, and all this other kind of stuff." How are people going to see through? This charade. How are they going to see through this kind of you know Machiavellian or Orwellian, um, uh, you know, double speak? Michael, I'm not really sure, um, to, to be very honest. Um, I'm going to talk about it. You're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it on these broadcasts. I'm going to write about it. I'm doing, uh, uh, if, you, if you've seen it or if others have seen it, <coughs> excuse me, I'm doing a, a, a PFD factoid uh, every day that tries to set the record sta- straight on the PFD. I do uh, as many corrections as I, as I reasonably can get to. Uh, during the course of a week uh, of what candidates are saying, I'm going to do some sort of of uh, 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 separate campaign, uh, individual campaign, a PAC campaign uh, in some races that try to raise these issues um, and and try to you know point out uh, the truth. Uh, but I'm not, and hopefully opposition candidates will. Uh, will bring these things to 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 light. I think Mike Dunleavy is doing a good job about saying that, you know, the SB 26 is not protecting the permanent fund, is not protecting the permanent fund dividend, uh, and hopefully that will become issues an issue during the campaign. Um, uh, 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 having a, a mark in the race, I think, uh, will will help raise the permanent fund uh, also. Uh, but I, I'm not entirely sure how the individual is going to see through this. I, it's really it's a responsibility of the press, um, and I don't, I don't mean to take on the press here, but it's a responsibility of the press to really lay out the facts. And what we've got in Alaska right now largely is a press that just repeats what candidates say, repeat talking points that, uh, that they're given by candidates or by caucuses uh, or by you know, the governor's press office. Uh, they're not really going digging down into it. Now, James Brooks did a good job with this, with the shadow budget. He did a good job in an analysis he did yesterday uh, of, of a publication from the Department of Labor looking at uh, 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 employment rates between government and, 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 and payment levels between government and the private sector that we're going to talk about here in a moment. So, and, and Matt Buxton does a good job occasionally uh, from, uh, from the Midnight Sun Alaska, does a good job fairly constantly, but occasionally he gets into these analyses of whether things are true or not uh, and does a good job when he does. But that's sort of, that's sort of where it occurs. It occurs as one-offs and, in, and in, uh, in, in, in publications that some people read, but not all people read. Um, you, you, we, you really, the, the ferreting out the truth, getting government to be honest, avoiding Orwellian newspeak, is usually a function of the press, and we just haven't seen a whole lot of it uh, uh, from the from the dispatch or from uh, from the television station, certainly, uh, or from other publications in the state. So I'm not entirely sure at this moment where voters are going to get the are going to get the real facts. Right, you and I have talked about how a couple times. I mean, I I I have made the comment that I mean I'm I'm a I'm not that great a writer, but that I could almost report because it seems like more than often than not, literally what we're seeing in the news is it, news is just a paraphrasing of the various press releases that are coming out from the majorities, the minorities, the special interests, and the and the and the governor's office. That just seems to be like I got the press release. Let me rewrite it in my own words and put it out there. As news, there is no deeper analysis of any of the consequences. And that's the thing. I mean, there has to be an analysis 
of the consequence. If you do A, we know that you want B, but what actually happens when we get to C? Does it actually accomplish B or, or not? And there just seems to be no deeper thought than... And maybe that's a consequence of our 24-7 news cycle. Maybe that's a consequence of our 148-character you know, uh, consumption of news media these days. But really, what we need more now than ever is that investigative Woodward and Bernstein kind of investigative style that looks at things and say, well, you're saying this, but here's what it really means, or here's where things are really going, or if you do this, does it really mean what you're saying it means? And I think... That's seriously lacking probably across the country. But here in Alaska, there's a complete and total dearth of it here in Alaska. Yeah, I um, I mean, this is part of the Orwellian situation we're finding ourselves in, right? I mean, Orwell, 1984, the government relied upon, well, took control of the press and used newspeak in the press. So the only thing that citizens heard was, was newspeak. They didn't, they didn't hear uh, uh, counterfacts, or they didn't have any deeper analysis. It was government said it's the PA, it's the Permanent Fund Protection Act, uh, and and you know, and so the press repeated in 1984 repeated it's the Permanent Fund Protection Act. It protects you know protects the permanent fund and protects your permanent fund dividend. Um, the government said it's a, a sustainable budget. And the press repeated it's a sustainable budget, didn't do any deeper analysis of it, of whether it was, in fact, sustainable, both for government and for the overall uh, economy. That was 1984. And and we are, I mean, to some degree, we're in that situation uh, in Alaska. Now, it's, you know, I don't want to blame individual reporters. I don't think that's fair. There's not enough of them. Um, uh, Nat Hertz had a, had a Twitter uh, uh, comment a few days ago that was, looking and analyzing the number of reporters that used to cover the Oregon state capital. And they're down to just a fraction of that uh, now as the, as you know, the, 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 the trade press shrinks. Um, and, and, and we've had some of that. We've certainly had some of that here, but it's putting us, in the, it's putting us in a very critical situation. It's putting us in a situation where the government does adopt new speak. They do, you know, create these new terms or apply these old terms uh, to, to, to things that they don't apply to. Uh, and then the press just lines up behind that and just, and goes forward with that, with that. So, I mean, you, you and I do what we can do on this program. You do what you could, what, what can be done, you know, the remainder of the week. Uh, I do what I can do in, in writing. Uh, some people suggest I could do more <laughs> and, and, and maybe I'll, I'll find the time to be able to do that, but it's, it, we, we, we've got to find ways to break through that and to and to at least have some analysis uh, of what the government's up to. Because right now we don't. We're just letting them get away with with creating these terms and 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 sort of a, appropriating these terms um, and and applying them in different ways. Brad Keithley's our guest. We're talking about again shadow deficits and uh, kind of the the news speak of the day. Uh, Brad, let's uh, let's let's break this down. You mentioned uh, James Brooks, who I think again is doing a yeoman's job in a lot of these areas, uh, and he's getting it right. I think more often than not in a lot of these things. Yesterday, he had some analysis on the employment numbers here in the state of Alaska, <clears throat> and there was some very very interesting things that came out of these employment numbers let's uh let's talk a little bit about that because uh the, my eyes were opened after we talked about it and i went back and started pulling through this report from the state of alaska there was some shocking revelations in there for me uh let's 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 hit on that well so james was digging down into a publication that came out from the department of labor uh, it's, it's an annual publication called the Census of Employment and Wages. It's a, it, it, it looks in retrospect. So this is for January to December 2017. Takes a while to put these things together. Takes a while to get the numbers finalized, but but it did. And 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 James looked at it from the standpoint of Chuno. Uh, the um, the the headline is Capital City loses jobs wages between 2016 and 2017. Obviously. He's looking at it for Juno because he writes for the Juno Empire. But the thing that just and, – and they did a chart, which was a very helpful chart. You don't find it in the report. He pulled out the numbers, and they did a chart at the Juno Empire. The thing that just shocks you uh, is it compares 
um, uh, average government wage to the average private sector wage uh, for, and then the minimum wage uh, for various years. And what I really had not realized, uh, but this chart brings it, brings it dead front in front of you, is how much larger, how much bigger the average wage for the average government wage, uh, and this is focused on Juno, the average government wage is over the average private sector wage. I mean, the, the average government wage, just looking at this chart, is in excess of $5,000. The average private sector wage is less than $4,000, again, right. Juno. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's sort of shocking that, that the government wage is that much higher than the private sector wage. I mean, the general concept <coughs> usually is that you want government wages to be about the same as the private sector wage because you don't want to be having people pulled out of government into the private sector uh, and, and, um, and, and shorting government on good people. So you want the government wages to be generally uh, the same. But this shows, at least for Juno, at least looking at this analysis, that government wages are way the heck higher uh, than private sector wages. Right. And, and, and when you get into the even deeper analysis, and I was, I was looking at this from a perspective of uh, not just the state, you know, not just the, uh, the municipalities, but the whole statewide. And I was looking at these numbers and I'm going to throw them up on the screen right here uh, for folks to see. Here are the numbers for the state. I mean, when you look at the total government uh, average monthly wages for the state, they are 10 percent higher just in wages uh, in the state. Uh, both for total government and for and for uh, state government over over private enterprise over over the over the private sector uh, and in fact if you work for the federal government you're making something like 30 or 40 percent more on average than you are in the private sector and then it then it hit me and in fact it, I had this aha moment you and I were chatting back and forth I had this aha moment this is simply the wages. This doesn't even account for the benefits. It doesn't account for retirement or health insurance or any other kind of perks that come along with it, which in my experience, especially when it comes to government sector, can account for, well, it counts for at least a minimum of 40% of wages. In some cases, when I worked for the Fairbanks North Star Borough, at one point, their their benefits package was 71% of wages. So if you made $50,000, you made another $38,000 on top of it of benefits and retirement and everything else. I mean, this is, I mean, that's almost obscene. Yeah, it's 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 certainly surprising. I, I mean, I my my initial reaction when I saw James's article is that uh, is okay. I can sort of see that for Juno, because Juno's where the headquarters of government is. So you're going to have a lot of senior level government down there, and you know, private sector in Juno is going to be largely tourism and fish. Those have a lot of lower wage jobs, so I can sort of understand that for Juno. But you're exactly right. When I, I, did, I had the same reaction when I went to the statewide numbers. The statewide numbers uh, are, um, are, are show that government wages are higher uh, than private sector wages across the state. Uh, and that's just, that's, that's disturbing. <laughs> I mean, so, so we've gone through this great debate about headcount, right? And that, and the government has not laid off uh, uh, to the to the same extent as, as the private sector has had to lay off as we've gone through this recession, that we've essentially transferred money out of the private sector through PFD cuts, pushed it into the government sector, and sustained a government sector that is that is stronger than the private sector by by that transfer. And, and but that's been more that that debate's been more about headcount. This is the first time, uh, frankly, that I've seen uh, or I've focused on the uh, uh, the wage numbers, and it shows that. That there's another issue here. Not only have we have we supported government more um, than than the private sector has been supported as we've gone through this recession, uh, but but government has maintained a higher payroll level uh, than the private sector has as we've gone through this recession. It's I mean this this is not what you want in government. You don't want government to be better sustained and higher higher paid uh, than the private sector. If you're if you're a capitalist, you want the private sector to be doing at least as well uh, uh, as government, if if not better. 
uh, because that's where growth occurs. That's where economic growth occurs that, that you know, generates additional economic growth and, and helps support government. Uh, but you don't want government to be sucking up all these resources uh, and taking it out of the private sector. But that's, I mean, you look at both jobs and you look at uh, wages, and that's exactly what's going on in this state right now. Well, it, this whole thing, again, worries me because, as you said, the whole idea behind offering a little bit of a better benefits package and kind of the golden parachute in government was that you would keep people there that wouldn't wouldn't escape to the private sector. But now, of course, Alaska has really become a government state. Uh, I remember there used to be a stat that was um, that that was floated around when I was on the assembly. Actually, one of our financiers came in and said it was something like 54 percent of Alaskans um, are dependent on government at one level or another for their for their income, for their for their uh, jobs, essentially. Uh, according to the state numbers that I looked at here, it's not quite that bad now. It's under 50 percent. But still, when you look at the fact that you've got nearly half of everybody in the state of Alaska working for government, that spells doom in the long run because they will protect that at almost all costs. And that, to me, is the most troubling aspect of this whole of this whole situation that you would protect. And of course, we've seen the legislature then jump on that bandwagon and actually lead the charge on it, protecting the public sector and the government jobs at the cost of the private sector. Yeah, I, uh, I, it's not quite, it's not quite 50, 50 between government and, and, uh, and, and, and the total the government's not quite 50%. I went back and no. did some numbers after, after I, after I saw those numbers, I went back and did some comparisons between, we've got the May 2018 employment level numbers out, the preliminary May 2018 employment numbers out. And that, that's, you know, and, and that's that's always a good time to stop and do some analysis. So I went back and compared May 2018 employment levels to May 2015 employment levels. And I used 2015 because that May May 2015 because it's the same month, but that's also just about the the last month before we plunged off into the recession. You see, you see employment levels start going down year on year. Employment levels start going down from that point forward. So it's sort of it's a it's a stopping off point to look at um, uh, at, at pre recession uh, employment numbers, and those numbers are are shocking. the 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 percent of of job loss in the state and local government sector from 2015 to 2018 uh, is only 1.74%. Um, and the percent of the workforce that was government before we went into the recession was about 19%, the percent of government after, uh, or the percent of, of employment after uh, now, May 2018 is a, is a little bit above that 20 20.28 percent, but you've got you've got government holding relatively constant um, a job loss state and local a job loss of 1.74 percent uh, through this period, and the reason I include local is <coughs> excuse me a lot of that local is school districts, um, and so it's indirectly state employment. School districts are held up are supported by in large part by the state. So the combination of the two is really a good measure of, 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 of state impact, state dollar impact. So that job loss has been 1.74% over the period. Now, let's go to the private sector. Oil and gas, between May 2015 and, and May 2018, job losses 34.27%. There were 14,000 in May 2015, they are 9,400 in May 2018, a difference of 34%. That's the job loss. Compared to government job loss of 1.74%. Construction, down 16.76%. Retail trade, um, uh, this, is, this is the one that, that held up longer than some of the other categories, uh, down 4.24% against government 1.74%. Professional and business services, down 9% against government's 1.74%. Healthcare is up 12.54 percent. We got a bunch of Medicaid money, additional Medicaid right, money. Right, right. We have we have we have an aging population, and so we have additional Medicare money that's coming in. So that that's had that's had growth. In fact, that right. growth is really coming a lar large part from government money. Um, but but the government through this entire period, the government has has sort of held even both on employment numbers. Um, and if you look at the analysis of wages, 
on wages. Private sector has plummeted both in employment numbers uh, and uh, in terms of wages. So we've, 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 <laughs> and, and then we go out and call this a sustainable budget, right? It's the same. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that highlights that highlights how Orwellian we have gotten in these terms we're using. That's not sustainable. You know, holding governments relatively constant at the expense of deep private sector cuts is not sustainable. That's not how you build a sustainable economy. Um, and so it's uh, th- these numbers are are sort of revealing. Um, uh, how uh, how government focused we've been the last few years. Well, and when you look at it and you realize that not just, I mean, 1.4% uh, or, or uh, 1.4 or 1.9% government, un, you know, uh, a reduction is, again, an average because we've seen some, like, for example, the municipality of Anchorage, they actually increased employment. There have been several governments around the state that have increased employment in this time of recession when everybody's tightening their belt. In some cases, they're expanding. It is the smallest segment of all sectors as far as uh, employment loss across the state of Alaska. And to me, that is the canary in the coal mine showing you how dangerous this is that they are the only one that has not slowed their role as far as that goes. They're the only one that continues to push forward, not just in employment, but as you just pointed out, in wages. I mean, in real time wages, not counting benefits. When we've got when we've got folks in in around the state uh, who are working for governments that are making at least 10 percent more than the private sector in wages alone, on average, that's that's. That's scary because that is truly the definition of unsustainable. Well, and and then you know, and then add, add on top of that, we're, we're sustaining that by pulling money out of the private sector, right? We're sustaining that by pulling by pulling permanent fund dividends that otherwise would that would go to support the private sector. We're pulling that out and redirecting that to government. So, not only are we are we helping government, not only are we s- sustaining government. Uh, but we're doing it at the expense of the private sector. We're making the private sector situation even worse than it otherwise is. I mean, oil, oil and gas prices drop. Yes. So oil and gas employment dropped. Y- yes, they dropped. They dropped dramatically. They dropped by a third. But uh, uh, we, we continue to pull money out of the private sector to help uh, to help support government uh, and keep government uh, employment up. I, you can't you can't do that. And have an overall sustainable economy. You're going to have government, but you're not going to have the kind of growth or, or even stability in the private sector that you need to have a functioning overall economy. Yeah, ab- ab- uh, absolutely. Brad Keithley's our guest. Pushing buttons back here, not making it work. Brad Keithley's our guest with Alaska's for a sustainable budget. Brad, I know you're out there writing stuff. I know you're trying to keep people informed, but let's face it, my audience is limited. Your audience is limited as far as reading your blog and your and your Facebook and everything else. The 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 news media, as we talked about earlier, has to step up their game. And and I guess people, what it really is going to count on is it's going to count on the people who are listening to this show. It's going to count on the people who are reading your blogs. It's going to count on the people who are you know on our Facebook pages, our various Facebook pages. They're going to have to share. I mean, this is what it's going to come down to. If you want to step up and catch this, if you want to enlighten the public during this time of election season when these politicians are out there doing their damnedest to double speak us all to death, we are going to have to we're going to have to work as kind of a grassroots efforts. We're going to have to use the power of social media and the viral aspect of it to try and share these things, to share these ideas that you and I have talked about, whether it's the charter of changes or the things that you're talking about. That's, that's our only hope because obviously the media in Alaska is not diving down into this. We are, but our reach is so limited compared to the ADN or any of these other major news outlets. This is the only way we're going to be able to fix this uh, coming into the election season. Give us your thoughts on this as we wrap up. No, I, I, I agree, Michael. It's a, it's a frustrating situation. Uh, it's one where, as I said, we see the occasional good analysis, but then, you know, sort of followed by a couple of weeks of or three weeks of just repeating whatever the heck the government's uh, press releases are. Um, and I agree that, that it's going to take uh, a, a grassroots effort to do it. 
um, you're you're a great uh, source of information. This show is a great source of information. More people need to listen to it. You do exactly right when you ask people when they when when the show starts to share and invite others to listen to it. Uh, the podcasts are up. Uh, I do breakouts of of my segments as podcasts, sharing, talking about it, getting candidates to talk about it, asking questions about it, uh, reposting it in media is is the way to to get the word out. So hopefully people will will do that. Brad Keithley has been our guest of Alaska's for a sustainable budget. I apologize having some tech issues here this morning trying to make these sound balances out properly. Brad, uh, folks want to find out more about you. Not only can they go to Alaska's for a sustainable budget, <clears throat> excuse me, where you post everything. I know you've got Twitter. I know you've got uh, your blog site. Give us the variety of places that people could find out about you and tell us, you know, where we need to uh, where we need to share it. Well, I. Uh, uh, Everything feeds into the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. So there's a lot of different places. I've got a Twitter. Um, I, I do uh, uh, tweets. Uh, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets does tweets. I've got a Facebook page, Brad Keithley, uh, on uh, on Facebook. But everything that we talk about on this show feeds back into the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page. So getting people um, uh on that site, reading those things, talking about it, sharing the things we post there, inviting their friends to to like the page, to follow the page uh, as well. Uh, for me, that's 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 where you can get that's where you get the biggest bang for the buck. Just following that page, and I would encourage everybody not only to do that, but to invite invite their friends to do it as well. The other place is is, is the show's page, the Michael Dukes. Uh, show Facebook page and uh, and and I would encourage everybody to to follow and share uh, share that as well. I think it's important if 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 you've got a, a social following, a social friends group, inviting them to follow key pages, uh, inviting them to follow Alaska for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, I think generates uh, a bigger bang for the buck than anything else. You can share individual articles out of it or individual stories uh, and those will have an impact when they hit but on a cons- constant basis getting people to follow that page follow your page i think uh, i think is probably the best way to do it I'm going to go ahead and abuse my privilege here as a host just for one more second because while we were talking, this comment came in, and I want your I want your comment on this comment here uh, as we let you go. This is from Harold. He says, we were speaking about news media. He said, did you see the KTVA report on the S&P rating agencies saying that the PFD spending is a good idea? He said, this is 100% untrue. By the way, KTVA is owned by GCI. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's I mean, that's the way the governor is pitching it, right? That 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 yes, our our credit rating uh, got stabilized. Um, I mean, all the credit rating agencies care about is whether the government's going to be able to pay its bills. That's all they're assessing. And if government pulls every dime out of the private sector so it can pay its bills, that's fine by the rating agencies. They don't care. Um, uh, even the overall economy may be going to hell, but and that'll affect certain companies in the overall economy, but. But the rating agencies just care about the government's ability to pay its bills. So, yeah, it's uh, as I say, there's just not a deeper dive uh, going on uh, in any of the media. They're just buying the press. They're just taking the press releases that uh, that the government's giving them, and uh, or the or the Senate Majority Caucus or whoever, uh, and running with that. And that's you know that's led us to things like PFD cuts. So, uh, the the antidote to that is get the word out. Uh, uh, in other ways. And as I said, uh, a good way to do that is to get friends to come on to the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets page as well as come on to the Michael Duke Show page. Brad Keithley has been our guest. Again, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Please share his page, share his commentary, share this, uh, share this uh, broadcast with Brad. Brad Keithley, thanks so much, my friend, for coming on board and joining us. We appreciate you being part of it. We look forward to uh, talking to you again next week. We hope you, uh, we hope you have a good week uh, in the intervening time, and we'll look forward to your next. Uh, we'll look forward to your next. Uh, 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 you know blog post and and deeper analysis that are problems that are out there michael thanks as always for having me i look forward to next week as well well that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from alaskans for sustainable budgets thank you again for joining us 
Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.